Hello, everyone. Um, a quick note, uh, we are live in two languages, in English on the Visual Voices Facebook page and in Turkish on the Anadolu, Anadolu Kultur Facebook page. Herkese merhaba. Bu yayın Türkçe olarak Anadolu Kültür'ün Facebook sayfasından, İngilizce olarak da Visual Voices'ın Facebook sayfasından takip edilebilir. Uh, on behalf of Visual Voices, I would like to, to welcome everyone joining us tonight. Uh, I'm so very pleased to be collaborating with Anadolu Kultur and really looking forward to tonight's discussion. Uh, before sharing more about the event uh, and introducing our speakers, I wanted to give a, take a few minutes um, for each of the partner organizations to share a little bit about their work, uh, to get it out there with the, uh, to share with the audience joining us tonight. I can go ahead and get started by introducing introducing Visual Voices. Uh, sorry, I'm just going to make sure that everyone has permission to record. Uh, sorry, um, technical difficulty. Uh, okay. Uh, let me just continue and I will sort out the recording in a little bit. Um, yes, so Visual Voices, uh, we are a nonprofit uh, organization based in Nicosia, Cyprus. Uh, we are also working internationally uh, and our focus is working with um, art, young visual artists from communities affected by violent conflict. Uh, we've built a network of over 100 organizations and in 47 countries. Um, and our methodology focuses around artists in, resident pro artists in residence programs uh, that incorporate peace education um, and bring young visual artists together for uh, conversations around themes, uh, conversations uh, around challenges that have resulted uh, from violent conflict um, and then developing non-commercial platforms of expression uh, for them to share their work uh, both locally and internationally. Uh, and we're doing that, we're developing a couple of different projects included an augmented reality, um, digital graffiti and storytelling application uh, that will archive socially engaged artworks from around the world and also um, allow users to bring them into their own environment and share. Um, I think uh, I'll leave it there for, uh, for our work for now, and I will hand it over to Asena to share a bit more about their work. Hello, everyone, and welcome. We are delighted to be here with these distinguished speakers. A warm thank you to all the participants and special thanks to our partner Visual Voices. Visual Voices is in the Nicosia hub of Vaha project run by Anadolu Kültür and Mitos. Baha is a two-year program made with and for the empowered voices of independent arts and cultural spaces, uh, advocating for public discussion and dialogue in cities across Turkey, Europe, and their neighboring countries. Anadolu Kültür has been realizing such projects with the belief that cultural and artistic exchange will help develop mutual understanding and dialogue. Since its foundation in 2002, Anadolu Kültür has been implementing various projects through culture and arts, to establish local, regional, and international collaborations, to support the production and sharing of cultural and artistic works, to create awareness about cultural heritage, to incorporate suppressed histories into collective memory. Anadolu Kultur has realized few projects with partners from Cyprus or in Cyprus before, and this collaboration with Visual Voices is an important step in bringing two societies together whose history, of, history is full of clashes and divisions. Thank you, Asena. Um, I will, so now a little bit more about uh, tonight's event. Uh, this conversation will bring together two artistic circles of people from Cyprus and Turkey to initiate more space where it is limited. As two circles move towards each other, they begin to intersect and interact and new shapes emerge. The overarching approach of this dialogue will embark upon artistic practice towards its relation to scholarly reflections. 
Thematically, presentations will build off of collective memory, deciphering the past and their connection to perpendicular and parallel narratives. What does collective memory reflect in spaces of deeply divided perspectives? How can collective memories speak to one another and contribute to constructive intercultural dialogue? How can addressing the multiple and repressed memories of the past through art guide the future? All in all, how does all of this fit within our relation to the complex and layered truth? I also want to mention that you should keep an eye out for the second event in this uh, two-part series, which will take place in two weeks from now on June 24th, 2021, also from 6 to 8 p.m. EEST, with a greater focus on civil society initiatives, their impact and challenges they overcome. I would also like to note that these conversations are part of the Anna Lynn Foundation's virtual marathon for dialogue in the Euromed and are made possible with the support of the Anna Lynn Foundation and the European Union. The Anna Lynn Foundation is an international organization which promotes intercultural exchanges and common projects among the civil societies of the Euro-Mediterranean region. Today, we are joined by four artists and or academics who, will be hearing, who we will be hearing from shortly. And I will now give the floor back to Asena to introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is Larissa Araz, born in 1990 in Istanbul. She produces works in a variety of media, including text, video, image, and sound. Through a personal viewpoint, she focuses on the topics of history, identity, memory, and belonging that are included or not included in social memory. The questions that are not answered by history that we repeatedly ask ourselves are the main threads of an existential research of Aras. Aras founded Poche Artist Run Space in April 2018. It's a physical and mental open space for those who feel the need for dialogue and critique. Along with short-term exhibitions and public programming, it also conducts long-term researches. Larissa will talk about her artistic practice with a special focus on her work titled Begin to See Through the Darkness. I was really impressed when I first saw this work at Saha Studio. When we started to talk about this collaboration with Visual Voices, I immediately thought of this particular work. Now I'm giving the floor to Larissa. Thank you, Asena, for the introduction. And thank you, Visual Voices and Anadolu Culture for such a great event. It's uh, very honoring to be around such great thinkers and artists right now um, at this time of uh, the year. Um, so uh, I will talk about a work specifically that I did, uh, thanks to Saab Foundation, uh, in Cyprus uh, two years ago. Um, I will now share my screen. Uh, for you to see the visuals of the installation. So, um, so I'll start with this image actually. Um, so this work had created, was evolved because of the news that I heard, uh, that I've seen in the internet uh, about a fig tree that was found close uh, by to Limassol. Um, the article was written by a journalist and a researcher, Sevgül Uluda, which was explaining a fig tree that was found in um, Ayos Yorgos Alamanos beach, maybe some of you would know it, uh, near Tilimasol, that was founded in the Cape, where, where it is very hard for, uh, for a tree to uh, grow because, of the, uh, because it was unable for any vegetation to grow, actually. When they found the uh, fig tree, they uh, immediately wanted to see how it grew. So they looked up it, to its uh, roots, uh, how it actually grew into the soil. And when they dig deep, they found out there were some human bones and cloth pieces around the fig tree. And this is the image actually, the cave that it was found. Um, and when they did the DNA test, they found out that they were belonging to three uh, uh, different bodies that were that were missing since 1974, and through that, that they found out that uh, the fig tree was actually belonging to a body that was identified within the cave that belonged to Ahmed Jamal, which is actually a fig grower. The fig tree, the type of the fig tree they they found inside the cave was a 
was not the type that endemic to that region. It was a, an Anadolia tree and Ahmed Jama, they thought that Ahmed Jama's last meal of this fig tree, fig, actually be, turned into a fig tree after uh, it was dynamited uh, for their death. And uh, when they looked up the UN reports, they found out that in 1974, there was a huge um, blast of a dynamite in that region. And so from that reason, the, the top part of the cave fell down and actually the body has seen sunlight. And the fig tree they found out, they found actually uh, as the same age as this uh, missingness of the uh, story. And after reading the story, I was so uh, moved by it because I thought that I found, um, I found the answer of all of my research that I could turn into a tree after so many fights and, and turn into a different thing after my death. Uh, um, I, I felt that I somehow found a saint in a way. And immediately I wanted to see this tree and prove it that it's existence. Um, for me, this tree was kind of a, um, kind of the blurry line between reality and fiction, a witness that is not human and also an evidence for a story that was missing for 30, 40 years. So I flew to Ilbasorn to see the tree and I found it, found the speech uh, through the right, uh, uh, uh, through the article that I read. But unfortunately, I couldn't find the tree uh, because the tree was missing. I guess it was because, yeah, first of all, actually, I thought uh, really that they exiled the tree too. But then I realized uh, because of the tree's roots, which is actually, uh, is very strong, especially fig tree's roots. Uh, there's even a saying in Turkish, uh, which is actually kind of, loosely translated to, um, to plant a tree to, your, to the heart of your home, which actually means ruining everything you built, um, is actually so strong that it needed to be dismantled to reach to, to the bones inside. Um, so I, I was, as I said, I was devastated to not to see uh, the tree there. And I was, yeah, the, the witness that I wanted to see was gone. So I was uh, with, I had any proof that this event had happened. And after a few days, I lost my Turkish ID. And if your name is Larissa and you want to move from south of Cyprus to north of Cyprus and then to Istanbul, it kind of become a bit problematic to move around. And for some hours, I realized I was trying to prove myself that I was belonging and uh, that I was trying to identify myself uh, from a, for a country. I realized everything that uh, I was doing um, for the identification purpose was actually meaningless. So I realized that I was actually focusing the totally the wrong thing. I was always moving forward what is present and what is there and what is solid and what is accessible, but everything is actually in the absence and the absence of actually not proving. So I started again yeah, after this um, after this incident, I realized I wanted to, I have to shape the, the, the, the change my perspective about the work itself. So what happened is I turned it, I looked at this uh, lost fig tree that I wanted to tell and I wanted to embed it in the story itself and give the agency to itself, to itself if it is lost, because that would actually explain everything that I wanted to tell within the story. So I will move to a moving image of the installation. So I wanted to create the fig tree's mythology, a new mythology for this specific one, actually. And I looked at the story from three different elements. One was the light, the other one was the cave, and the third one uh, was the shadow. Um, I wanted to put the shadow of, of the fig tree inside the space. Um, as the lingering, a very smooth uh, shadow of the tree, of this lost, specific lost tree. But as soon as you start lingering inside of that space, 
which for me, it's a confrontational space, you realize that, that there is something uncanny about it. Um, I, the idea was, came, from, um, came from the shadows that we're living underneath, actually. Um, this, whether this can be a religious shadow, political shadow, or even your family's shadow, you're under so many shadows that you don't know that your existence uh, is whether, whether it's underneath or whether you can escape it. So I wanted to turn this, the non-existence of the tree and give it to a shadow uh, for the space. It's, it's kind of reflection of past and present and where you're standing in between. And this uh, middleness of the story is actually within every part of the story. Because when the bodies were found within the cave, it was kind of uh, those three bodies were actually saved from limbo because the missing bodies, missing people are not specific to um, Cyprus story. It's embedded in Turkish story in every each decade actually. And these missingness, I actually feel like they're kind of, they're kind of not dead, but not alive too. So, this being in the cave is like stopping the whole act of history and being just being in the limbo and people are, who are waiting them or who are waiting their justice are in limbo too. So I wanted to uh, give back this uh, sense of continuing by printing the image of the grave, uh, sorry, the cave, which for me was the grave um, in coffin sized uh, images. So I would make it a closure for me, for myself, especially uh, in this story. And there is the third part, which is for me was the light um, and the contrast of it, which is the dark. And for me, um, the light is always like, if, we're, if you look into most of the mythological uh, stories, such as the creation story, there's always this dictating voice which comes from light, which is like very ideological, very uh, positioning. And I wanted to give voice to the, to, to the contrast, contrary to uh, darkness, which is for me the soil. And actually the, the main uh, story, the, the, how can I say? The main storyteller of this story actually. So there is within this uh, installation, there is this voice inside the soil altar by the way, for the altar, I want to make an altar, which looks like if whether there's a something buried inside, whether it can be a, a body or nothing, but there's like one pile of soil, which actually kind of imitates how nations build itself. Most of the time, most of the nation, I mean, nations need a temple and an altar to create itself, to function, to create a story. So I wanted the space to be, the whole um, space of this uh, installation to be the temple and that altar to be the uh, uh, soil. And there is a voice inside that um, soil pile, uh, which is my voice, talking about this whole story through a viewpoint of my own experience to it, mimicking the storytelling of, uh, of, a, of mythological storytelling it's like a very uh, uh, uh, sharp voice talking about the whole thing but turning into something that um turning into and like making fun of everything that has been told was wrong and you have been looking at from the wrong perspective in a way so the, and there was also one little piece in it too which is not visible and unfortunately you cannot uh, sense it too um there was a smell of fig within the space um, I wanted to put this smell part in it because although um, this memory, like fig has a totally different memory in most of, it, most of us. It has a specific um, history in within all of our uh, backgrounds. And to remember this uh, absence, um, I think smell, I mean, uh, the, the, the emotion of smell uh, creates the same uh, bond as the absence of remembering. So I wanted to put that smell there um, to talk about the absence of the whole story inside. And immediately people who got into the space, this temple-like uh, place, uh, realized that there was something coming up to their noise, but they couldn't recall what it is. 
So it was kind of shifting between memories inside. So that was the, actually the story of the, how I found this specific fig tree and how it turned out to be something that I um, explain the absence through yeah, the present through the absence of it. Thank you, Larissa. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Now I'll give the floor to Yael Navarro. Uh, first, I'll introduce her briefly. Yael is originally from Istanbul, Turkey. She studied at Brandeis University in the sociology department and Princeton University, MA in anthropology and PhD in anthropology. She was lecturer in social anthropology at the University of Edinburgh and has been teaching at the University of Cambridge since 1999. I have been following Yal's work since late 19s. I read her dissertation while working as an editor at Iletişim, and I still remember how her critical look at civil society in Turkey made a great impression on me. In 2012, her ethnographic work, The Make Believe Space, Affective Geography in a Post-War Polity, was published, which focused on post-war politics and social relations in Northern Cyprus. But actually, while inviting her more than this work on Cyprus, we had in mind her project with three other academics, Remnants in mind. Remnants project was aiming to trace remnants left behind by communities who were displaced, deported, exterminated, or ethnically cleansed, and also studying the place of such remainders in Turkey's present day politics. I would like to give the floor to Yar. Thank you so much, Asena. Um, and it's really wonderful to be here and uh, see old friends from Cyprus, Amber, and also to have met Larissa and uh, to have the opportunity to talk about her work, which I found really fascinating and enormously resonant with my current uh, and ongoing uh, concerns and research. Um, just this, this work of art um, is, um, tremendously interesting because it brings to mind a memory that um, goes beyond the human being or the psyche and subjectivity, which has been the focus of more traditional memory studies. Uh, the more, um, the, the kind of memory studies which would uh, delve into the interiority of the human psyche and how memory somehow resonates there. Um, here we, um, in Larissa's work, um, we see an amazing example for memory as distributed beyond uh, the human body, as spatialized and embedded in materiality. And more specifically, memory as um, resonating uh, in and through the soil or memory of and in the seed. In this case, um, the seed of, um, of a fig that happened to be found in the pocket of Ahmed Jamal, who is a missing person from 1974 in a village near uh, Limassol. So um, very, very inspiring uh, sorts of associations come to mind as to how does one do research on memory in sites of disappearance? Uh, in sites of erasure, in sites of effacement where evidence has been, um, well, erased, where um, the search for uh, bodies of the missing often has been made tremendously difficult, uh, where the witnesses are either dead or have been silenced. So the traditional roots for the retrieval of memory uh, have been, well, criminalized, often denied, rendered impossible silenced. Here, I'm also thinking of my ongoing current research in uh, Turkey, more specifically in South Turkey, in Antakya and its environs, by reference to the Armenian genocide and its aftermath. And there are very interesting comparisons also with Cyprus, with Palestine and elsewhere, where uh, the more, if you will, conventional routes for uh, researching memory have uh, are not possible in a sense. And the very notion of what is what constitutes evidence and what constitutes a witness have to be reconceptualized. So I see Larissa doing that reconceptualization through her, her artistic work. And when we discussed uh, Larissa's work uh, prior to this meeting today, 
uh, Larissa actually spoke of the fig tree as a witness. Um, um, bir tanık olarak incir ağacı. And that I found um, enormously interesting because um, uh, much further than the conventional idea of the archive where, where one sees a mask there gathered together a whole set of source books through which one can search the past. Here we see a far more unconventional, non-conventional, surprise, uh, uh, surprising form of archive, if we want to call it archive, uh, the fig tree as an archive perhaps, uh, which completely serendipitously emerges and somebody joins the dots and makes an associations. What could this fig tree be doing coming out of a cave? I mean, this kind of fig tree doesn't exist in this part of Cyprus somehow. And uh, how could it be coming out of a cave? And then it is found out that somebody had somebody's body had been uh, probably thrown there. And through the forensic um, anthropologist's work, which has been ongoing, it is found out that it is that of Ahmed Jamal. Who, is, who has been a missing person since 1974. So um, this makes me think of um, the idea of distributed memory, memory that is distributed um, between, the memory that again, isn't just encapsulated in the human body and her or his subjectivity, but more distributed memory, memory that somehow is distributed across more than human domains in relations between human beings and non-human entities, such as nature, trees, the land, plants, the soil, seeds. It could be material objects, uh, space, houses, etc. And memory as distributed across materialities is something that I had studied in Cyprus and that I go on to study in, um, uh, in Turkey as well. And one example that I would like to give, because it really reminded me of um, a case that I have been writing about uh, at the moment um, that emerges from my research um, in, uh, in Musada, actually, which is a mountain um, originally inhabited, still inhabited by Armenians, but very few of them in the aftermath of the Armenian genocide, as well as the famous um, battle of the Armenians of um, Musada against the Ottoman army's um, somehow um, uh, attack uh, of them in 1915. There is a place near uh, the uh, Kebusie village of Musada, which was renamed Kapusuyu uh, by uh, Turkey. Uh, Kebusie was originally an Armenian village which was resettled by people through Iskian in Turkey, the settlement project. Very near this um, uh, village, if one walks upwards towards the mountain, there is a site that is spiritually and cosmologically resonant that is called Ashik Mashuk by people of the, of the region. When you speak to Armenians of the village of Vakuf, which is the only village where Armenians still um, live in a sense, uh, they note that Ashik Mashuk is associated with uh, a saint that is uh, of central importance for, for Musada Armenians uh, called Surp Sarkis. On the other hand, the site of Ashik Mashuk, which has a, a wishing tree, a tree where people tie pieces of cloth and make wishes, particularly when they would like to um, manifest their love or have a child. It is now not... Um, frequented by Armenians anymore, uh, most of whom um, have been forcefully displaced or, or, or killed, but primarily by Arab Al Alawis of Samanda, who uh, climb up the mountain to Musada and visit this site. Interestingly, it is the same site which um, has retained that uh, spiritually resonating memory. So it makes me think of, again, memory as distributed across that which is more than human somehow, uh, a cosmologically embedded memory. So this site, which used to be associated with, with Surp Sarkis, is now associated with the prophet Ali. And the mythology somehow has been created where people speak of the prophet Ali having jumped from the other side of Musada up to, uh, through the valley uh, onto this side and laid um, a mark of his uh, um, uh, of his horse um, on the cave, and people continue to visit the site. 
So in a sense, Musada is one another one another brilliant example for a site where a lot of the evidence has been effaced and where more direct routes for um, uh, memory um, are very convoluted in a sense because the witnesses are dispersed or dead or they are not there. And therefore it, it makes me think again of distributed memory of cosmologically uh, resonating spaces somehow. Where does one look for memory where the witnesses are no longer there, where the evidence has been erased? This is the, these are the kinds of questions I think where Larissa's artistic work and my own work really speak to one another. So I'm going to just stop there and we can continue later. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Larissa. And yeah, now I'm giving the floor back to Altan. Thank you. Yes, thank you both uh, for your presentation. I just want to make sure real quick, uh, Joanna, are you with us? And can you turn on? Yes. OK, um, I'll, I'm going to introduce Joanna now. But quickly, I also want to remind anyone out there joining us on Facebook Live on either of the two pages, uh, if you think of a question at any point during the presentations and would like to share, please feel free to write it as a comment on Facebook Live. We'll be monitoring uh, all of the comments, questions, uh, et cetera, and we'll be sharing it with, the, with our speakers tonight so that they have an opportunity to answer. Um, so our next speaker uh, is Ioana Neofitu, uh, who is a multidisciplinary artist, director, and researcher based in Athens. She currently works as an art professor in Greece and is a PhD candidate at the Ex Marseille Université in France, France, conducting a research under the title The Images of War and the War of Images, Contemporary Art and Documentary in the Necropolitics Era. Her artistic practice and her research focus on conflicts and their meta-narrations meta on the importance of images as a tool for history narration and as an object of instrumentalization in the conflict. With a long-standing interest in concepts such as geopolitics, ideology, histo historiography, national identity, and contemporary wars, her artistic practice has resulted throughout the years in multiple forms such as documentaries and, documentaries and short films, video, video installations, performances, and sculptures. With that, I'll pass the floor to Joanna. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Do you hear me well? Great. I find very interesting the idea of bringing together artists and academics from Cyprus and Turkey, two countries with uh, interrelated and conflicting uh, histories in their background. And I also find very significant the fact that you choose a Greek Cypriot artist to participate in this discussion, which in my opinion shows a deep concern in presenting multiple interpretations of the subject. Allow me to express my pleasure and deep honor for choosing me as a speaker in this discussion. And I especially would like to thank Visual Voices for this invitation. Uh, so I will begin introducing myself by presenting my, my research and artistic practice, and then I would like to discuss the questions uh, introduced by Alden. So as Alden said, I'm a visual artist and documentary director. I was born in Limassol in Cyprus in the mid 80s, and I currently live in Athens working as an art teacher in a private school. I grew up in the Greek Cypriot community in a family that strongly supported the reunification of the island. I was raised uh, in, in, in a family where a war between nations was considered as useless separations between equal human beings and where borders were considered as technical distinctions, wounds on the surface of the earth. So I had from an early age, a very conflicting relationship with the dominant narratives that educate the Greek Cypriot community. Something that made me very skeptical about both Greek and Turkish nationalism and about the traditional interpretations of culture. Politics and visual culture, and of course uh, their interrelation, were key factors that defined me as an artist from the very beginning. 
Uh, as Alden said, I, I am a PhD researcher in contemporary art and uh, documentary practices. And in my research, I examine artists that work with uh, images emerging from uh, sophisticated surveillance systems, often named operational images, and that explore through their creative reuse concepts such as necropolitics, violence, vulnerability, otherness, and precarious life. I am interested in the way in which contemporary interpretations of war are strongly defined by the way in which we render these conflicts visible or invisible. Through my research, I explore the technological advances of war machines that render violence invisible in contemporary, in contemporary conflict. These advances are also related in the capacity of machines in developing independent from the humane vision. Uh, as an artist, I'm also interested in similar questions, and I would like to present three of my works which uh, explore the themes of failure, reconciliation, and I will then try to relate them with the thematic axis of our discussion. So I will share my screen. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, so this is an installation under the title Identity Exhaustion, or There is No Place Left for White and Yellow, uh, which I presented in the exhibition Crossing 2431. I always confuse south to north, north to south. A communal contemporary art exhibition, which took place in Gede Institute on the Green Line in Cyprus. The exhibition was organized by Visual Voices as a result of a three-month uh, artist in residency program that brings together 11 Greek and Turkish Cypriot visual artists who explore the themes of media and nationalist narrations. So the work Identity Exhaustion examines the conflicting, examines the conflicting relationship that the inhabitants of Cyprus have with their national identity using the symbols and the flag. The starting point of this creation was the history and ideas behind the Cyprus flag. Uh, it is a flag that it was designed by the Turkish Cypriot artist and teacher Ismet Yunei, uh, following an international contest. The symbol of the new state of the Republic of Cyprus in the 1960s was mainly aiming to promote unification and peace between the inhabitants, as it avoided any reference uh, to blue and red, and to either the cross and the crescent moon that directly refer to traditional symbols of Turkey and Greece. Instead, the, the flag of the Republic of Cyprus used more neutral colors, such as white, yellow, and green, and the united branches of olive on the bottom wished to symbolize unification of all the inhabitants of the island. But far from representing the newborn state and Cypriot identity, the flag has since then been undermined and often replaced by other flags promoting various national identities. As a result, the public space of the island on both sides is saturated from multiple flags which exhale a disordered nationalist identity, most often related to Greece and Turkey. In the flag I created, the conflict, ah, sorry here. In the flag that I created, the conflicting nationalist symbols and colors saturate the image of the island in a point that we hardly distinguish the shape of the island. They also demolish white and yellow as well as the olive branches. The flag is accompanied by an installation of two paint cans of white and yellow paint that are watched over by toy soldiers. This installation is an effort to deal with the trauma of constant separation, separation and with the dichotomy that has been undermining the Cypriot identity since the creation of the Cyprus state. It is also a comment on the militarization of the island, on the failure of, on reunifying the, its inhabitants in the distorted nationalistic discourse that saturates the public sphere of both sides of the island. It is a quite pessimistic vision on the island's condition, I would say, which in the same time search ways of rendering visible the absence of shared narratives that could embrace equally both communities. 
I believe that there is a question emerging vividly from this work. How do we deal with uh, conditions of non-solution, of constant separation and, and dichotomy? Moreover, as dichotomy seems to have become a permanent condition, how do we escape from separation? How do we breach each other? Uh, we leave this question unanswered for further discussion later. And uh, I would like to move on in another theme, uh, which is uh, the reconciliation through artist artistic practice. I would like to present two of my projects that examine this question, but also respond to the question addressed to me at the invitation of this discussion. How do we address the multiple and oppressed memories of the past through art? And how could artistic practice propose a paradigm of future behaviors? So I would like to talk to you about uh, a documentary video, which is the result of a three month painting workshop that I have organized in Skaramagaz refugee camp in Greece for refugee children from Afghanistan. During the workshop, children were invited through painting and creative games to share their experiences and memories from their journey and exile, but also to describe the conditions that they live in and the future that they imagine. I would like to show you I would like to show you uh, the trailer of the video. Is it possible, Alden, to show? Uh, yes, I think just be sure when you're sharing your screen uh, that you allow for sound as well. There's a box you need to tick. Yes. Okay, great. Itiori ek bile itiori bise nashin ya ve mi ek etraf Amerika ya ve mi eta ke evi mektaba khala kula So in this work uh, with Dimitris Tamatis, we were interested in the exile as it was witnessed uh, by young eyes of a child and the way that children make sense of their experience. We were deeply interested in creating a documentation of their personal life, of an experience that it was collective to their community, but in the same time lacked the representation. Painting and arts in general came to play a very important role in this process not only as a tool of rendering visible a condition that remain undocumented, but also as a way of creative expression, as a tool of understanding and sharing their experience and traumatic memories. In the end, an exhibition was uh, created, was organized in the camp, and the children invited their families and relatives to view their work during the workshop. So in a sense, a collective memory came to be organized and represented through these paintings. 
I will move on to a next project, uh, which is a split screen documentary under the title The Fairs. This project is a work about the borders and the technical separation of people that in different circumstances could actually live peacefully together. It traces the story of the creation of the Greek Albanian border. At the end of the Balkan Wars, the installation of borders between newborn uh, nations was mostly a result of political will and power and less of the actual conditions of population. So in the village of Kosovica, the inhabitants found themselves from one day to the next, separated in two by the installation of the Greek Albanian border. As a result, the village, uh, the village was bisected and the inhabitants suddenly had different national identities and lived under different deep political regimes that excluded any communication in between them. So when the Soviet Union collapsed, the borders between Greece and Albania opened again, and the inhabitants of the two villages started timidly to reapproach each other and to establish a communication. Still, the years of separation left deep wounds, especially to the oldest people of the villages, but also a detachment and prejudice in between the youngest. I examine the history through the perspective of the summer fairs that are very important cultural events in the summer, a time when the two communities share music and dance. I was very interested in this story because I could project my personal desires for a for reunification of Cyprus. I followed them in a wish to experience the border as a technical separation and as an imposing, uh, as an imposing condition. But in the same time, I found out that the years of separation created new kind of borders, different communities attached to different collective memories and with different national narr narrations. In these villages, the separation is still vivid Although in the happiness and joy of the festive atmosphere of the fairs, we can witness it. In both of the last two projects uh, I, I share with you, art becomes uh, a unification tool. They emerge as a cultural phenomenon of representing collective experience that could actually be unifying for people. Through this project, I wish to propose artistic practice as a way to to reconciliate with traumatic past as a way to embrace otherness. However, there's actually a point uh, that my presentation hadn't touched until now and with which I would like to conclude. So I shall repeat the question addressed to this discussion. What does collective memory reflect in spaces of deeply divided perspectives? How can collective memory speak to one another and contribute to constructive intercultural, intercultural dialogue? I think the way that the French philosopher Paul Riguet reflects on collective memory could be very helpful in our discussion. So I read, every historical community was born out of a relationship that can be unambiguously equated with war. What we celebrate as founding events are essentially violent acts later legitimized as a by a precarious rule of law. The glory of some is the humiliation of others. Celebration on one side is met by execration on the other. This is how wounds, which are not necessarily symbolic, are stored away in the archives of collective memory. So in a sense, the way that social identities are constructed is very related to the point of view that we choose to examine history. The past and the collective memories have the capacity to intervene in present conditions. They are the glasses through which we explain the present world and they have the power to either demolish or maintain separation. In this sense, memory could be freedom, but also memory could be a prison. The 20th century, in my opinion, is a very dark place, full of distinctions and violence, full of national declarations and conflicting narrations. I personally believe that the usage of collective memory could be very tricky in the Cypriot context, since the formation of the use of multiple contradictive collective memories doesn't leave that much space for reconciliation. 
At the same time, it is, it is almost impossible to imagine new communities completely detached from any past reference and without connection to some kind of collective memory that unifies the community. We are in a way trapped in a condition where the past is impossible to avoid, but it hides distinctions, violence and separation. So the only way out of this dilemma is to probably search for new narratives and alternative ways of perceiving the past and the contemporary reality. In this process, which places the condition of dialogue as its starting point, exactly what we do here, arts could and would play a fundamental role. I wish to finish my presentation with a documentation of an artistic practice that puts in place a desire for new narratives emerging from the past while working as an act of reconciliation, leaving space for future communities to emerge. It is a documentation of the research project of the artist and theorist Ariela Zulai, created in 2012 under the title Civil Alliance. In this work, Jewish and Palestinians gather around a map of Palestine and read loud acts of reconciliation. I will now show you just a small extract of the film. Jabalia. מוכתר ג'בליה שפעל למען השלום בין ג'בליה לבת ים מוכה קשות על ידי מתנגדים. מעלה החמישה, בית סול. מעלה החמישה, בית סול. נציגי כפר בית סול וכפר קטן באו לבקש סליחה ושלום מהיהודים. היהודים צלחו על החזיר, אך שאר הדברים הועברו לדיון שהתקיים בפני קצין המחוז. בפגישה סוכם שהיהודים מבטלים את התביעה המשפטית נגד בנו של המוכתר וסולחים על העלבון. קריית קטנה ומעלה החמישה. קריית קטנה ומעלה החמישה. טלבו סוכן קריית קטנה בסבב בלחירסה המוג'ודה פי קריה أن يكون سكان عليها حمشاء بإعلامهم مسبقا بهوية من ينوي القدوم إليهم من طرفهم هكذا سيتم تفادي إلحاق أذى لا ضرورة له بالأشخاص والحفاظ على علاقات الجيرة عرب ساهل بسان كفاغ وبين عرب ساهل بسان كفاغ وبين בעקבות הרצח של תושב כפר רופין נכרתה ברית שלום. כ-300 איש מיישובים שונים באזור השתתפו בסולחה. בנוסף על האוכל והנאומים סוכם הפיצוי תסקיר שיוקדש לחינוכו של הקהל הנרצח את ירחם. תושבי כפר טירה שלקחו על עצמם את גידולו, התחייבו לפני כל הנרצחים לחנכו ברוח הפיוס ולהשלים Okay. So what the description of this work of Ariela Zulai, uh, it points out intense civil activity was happening throughout the country, mainly in urgent encounters, some short and spontaneous, others planned and carefully laid out in detail, in which participants raised demands, so compromises, set rules, formulated agreements, made promises, asked for forgiveness, made efforts to reconciliate and compensate, and did everything possible not to let violence take over their lives. They did their utmost to halt the violence that national and military forces were intent on igniting in, in, in and negotiated with each other in order to create mutual civil alliances. I will leave you with this quote because in my point of view, it refers to the desire of creating new alternative and reconciliative narratives along with mutual civil alliances that could 
and I hope one day will guide us for the future. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Joanna, for your presentation. Uh, we'll continue with the last presentation before open discussion. Um, and I would like to introduce Anber Onar, uh, who is an independent artist and cultural producer based in Cyprus. Her educational background includes a BFA in the visual arts from Rutgers University and a master's from the Eastern Mediterranean University with a focus on film interpretation. She taught visual arts at, the, at Bilken, Bilken University in 1991 to 1992, and then at Eastern Mediterranean University from 1992 to 2006. In 2007, she co-founded Side Streets Educational and Cultural Initiatives in Nicosia, where she has organized a wide range of exhibitions, lectures, workshops, film series, and related events. She has also curated and co-curated co various exhibitions in Cyprus and Istanbul. Her own artwork involves different textual, textual and visual disciplines and mediums, and she is an active participant in international art exhibitions, conferences, and workshops. She is currently completing a book on Abdullah Onar, a prominent modernist Cypriot artist in Cyprus. With that, I'll give the floor to Amber. Yes, hi. Um, first of all, thank you. I'm the last one to talk, so you're probably all very tired by now, but um, I'll try and keep it as brief as I can. Um, and thank you for uh, Visual Voices for inviting me and Anadolu Kultura as well. Um, I'm going to read my presentation first. I'll try and get my... Um, presentation out okay um yes so i called my um little talk artistic gestures and i will start with um uh, collective memories or memories people have in common with a group such as a family a social network a neighborhood or a state however the largest a uh, level of collective memory can be problematic as it is made up of the written recorded memories of dominant state ideologies, which assume that there is a collective with concrete definitions and borders of such a group. All communities, nations and countries have such assumptions. So there's always a need for alternative independent cultural workers promoting artistic gestures which question ideologies and point out human conditions and problems. So maybe for me, the best way to start conversation about this is by demonstrating how we have dealt with some of, these, some of the ideas in understanding the issues of memory, territory, marginality, identity, etc. So for this, I would like to talk about the initiative that my partner, Johan, and I uh, um, co-founded in 2007 called Side Streets. Um, but before I discuss Side Streets, I should give you a context and tell you about Outside the Project, a 2005 art inst installation, which covered the entire facade of a five-story building, office building, uh, in the center of the um, Nicosia. <clears throat> Sorry. I created this work after some months of research, photographing, interviewing the people living inside the walled city of Nicosia. At the time, about 90% of the walled city population was low income immigrant workers and their families from Turkey. Many of them were living in squalid conditions without electricity or running water. And the municipality had basically turned a blind eye towards their situation. So there were already existing disputes regarding territory, architecture, culture, migration, race, belief, economics, and politics. This project was to transform the entire facade of the building to give it an appearance of a, of a local inner city slum tenement using rusted corrugated iron, bits of wood, shattered windows, um, dirt, graffiti, and ragged laundry hanging from the 
from clotheslines. Most of the material was donated by the residents of the city and the, and the transformed facade reflected their living conditions. This work therefore foregrounded the margins of the city by bringing them explicitly into the middle of the city center. Its effects was to create a widespread public discussion of everyday experiences of seemingly local, but in reality global issues. Within a day, a project provoked a, uh, a broad discussion of social issues in the newspapers, and the mayor of Nicosia responded with, uh, first with a warning notice and then sending out the police to block off the main street and team of workers to illegally tear down the artwork. This provoked a further public discussion about art and censorship. Over 200 newspaper articles or columns were written in response to or commenting on the project, which had brought the, brought the ignored background of the city into the foreground. So, so this, this is how we start Side Streets, basically. So in 2007, Side Streets was established in the same location where this project was exhibited. Um, until then, I, I, I was working at the university and in 2007, I quit the university to start this initiative, actually. So in 2007, CITES was established in the same location where this project was exhibited. Its purpose was to provide a platform for opening cultural forms through creative and intellectual activity. The idea was to initiate discussions, questioning the dominant culture, but also to create a culture of self-questioning, always providing different points of view, so as not to create one, uh, create or accept one dominant truth, but instead to gather diverse experiences which stand together for a dialogue and analysis. This can be seen in the project Side Streets was involved in or open discussions with, and here I will briefly talk about four of these uh, projects. We had thousands of them, but four of them, uh, just to have an idea. Um, the first one I, I talk about is called the Untitled History, Plastic Arts in North Cyprus, which was never done before. We don't have any, any comprehensive um, libraries. We don't have any um, um, such archives where we can gather all this, what has been happening in Cyprus and so on, especially in the North. So. Um, this project was to project um, uh, showcasing the result of one year research in initiative uh, into the forces shaping the plastic art scene of North Cyprus over 26 years from 1979 to 2006. This was an opportunity for the public to look at comprehensive assessment of developments in the plastic arts during that time, complete with original exhibition posters, catalogs, clippings, video footage and other materials. The exhibition was complemented by workshops and panel discussions that were held in 2008. And it illustrated how a narrative can be constructed by collecting and juxtaposing fragments of information together to create a frame of reference and how this narrative and frame may relate to other narratives and frames in complex ways, blending, clashing, dissolving, or entering into a dialogue with them. Another uh, project that I, I talk about is Layers of Space, an architectural exhibition focused on the award-winning architectural project to design the presidential administration office for North Cyprus. The exhibition featured the plans and the 3D animations of the project, but also recorded interviews with the current inhabitants of the proposed site. This site was, was controversial um, because the tenants of the existing buildings uh, who would be relocated were against it. And there was, there was also a lot of discussion about the project's consequences, not only for people, but for the city in terms of gent gentrification and other concerns. So by setting up this, the project in this way, SiteSits was pro trying to provide a platform for, the, for all the sites to engage in dialogues. Um, another project um, that uh, we had was a project called the Border Stamps towards the semiotics of postal representation, explored ways of exploring ways of traveling in time and space through a semiotic analysis of postage stamps 
issued on Cyprus in different periods of the island's cultural and political history. These stamps function in various ways as modes of communication and as a means of authorizing communication, as instruments of ideology, and as a mobile form of public art and cross, uh, that crosses and questions cultural, geographical, political, and legal boundaries. So this semiotic and historical analysis of Cyprus stamps provide the useful context for viewing contemporary issues surrounding borders and looking at the way they define or determine individual and social identities on the island. And the final project I would like to talk about is the Lost Mosaic Wall, which was focused on the history of a 227 square meter mosaic wall, which had been made by the artist Bedi Rahmi Eyboğlu for the Turkish pavilion in, at the 1958 Brussels World Fair. The wall had been considered lost for decades, and this project for the first time revealed what happened to it between Belgium, Turkey, and Cyprus, and located fragments that remain. The question, um, the question raised by, this, by the project included these. How does one represent nation or country or region outside of its geographical location? Because it was in the Brussels Fair and this was there, you know, big showcase for that. To what extent can a wall or a border uh, linkage a border represent linkage and unification. Can archives, exhibitions, artworks, and monuments resist absorption into memorial narratives and instead express fragmentation and forgetting? These kinds of, uh, these kinds of uh, very diverse disciplines and engagements at side streets include the wide, wide range of people of different nationalities, genders, and ages and with different occupations, political or intellectual backgrounds, and so on. Through them, we were able to observe the continual physical, political, anthropological, psychological, and social changes that shape a, a culture. In this context, I think of circles as frames of reference through which individuals and groups uh, see things, either through shared memories or by questioning them. The changes create dynamics which allow new circles to form and collapse at all times. And these circles also move, intersect, separate into sub uh, subsets, dissolve uh, in, and reinvent themselves as different, sp as different spaces, uh, spaces uh, and times. Identifying, identifying, imagining, constructing these circles and their narratives and acting in or on them would depend on the perspectives of the viewers, readers, onlookers, or actors. Every narrative created has to have a con consensus or relevancy among others in order to be rejected or accepted. Uh, so re as a result, rather than art guiding the future, it may be the artistic gesture or making a gesture for art that guides the future. In other words, valuing art as a, a, a way of mediating or facilitating art as a human gesture, allows artists and communities to understand each other by exposing their language, culture, and intention. I'll briefly mention one local example for this. Uh, in 2019, there was an exchange of cultural art artifacts between the two communities in Cyprus. The Turkish Cypriots returned several hundred artworks by Greek Cypriots that had remained in storage in the north since the war in 1974. And the Greek Cypriots handed over media reports and television footage related to Turkish Cypriots' history, which had been inaccessible to them. This is a simple example of gesture based, not on commonality, but on each community's recognizing the value of the others art and culture, dialogue on a purely human level. So rather than looking for collective memory, it seems that analyzing and foregrounding individual memories, which are perceived as independent or oppositional, and creating a dialogue through artistic gestures, 
might contribute better to generating an intellectual dialogue in a more sincere way. And this does not necessarily mean having much in common. Looking for commonality may reduce the power of one's will to discuss or enter into dialogue or to understand the other. Instead, the point is to enable individual, unique or oppositional memories to stand and be valued on equal level which, with collective memories. In other words, a dialogue or an understanding of the other should not necessarily be based on com common me memory, but on differences recognized as equally valuable for all parties. The originality of an artwork or an artistic gesture or conception is important in feeling, feeling one's mind from thinking in the same way repeatedly and from getting caught in the same traps as the ones before. And recognizing differences is more dynamic and exciting as the next level to that is for all, uh, for all those involved to be standing next to each other on equal levels while also recognizing that change in this stand is inevitable for, for uh, future commonality. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Amber. Uh, I think if you exit the share screen mode, yeah. I can go to the gallery view. Ah, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, Amber, thank you for your presentation. And thank you to all of the speakers now for uh, sharing your insights and kind of creating a foundation for the next stage of the, the conversation. Uh, at this point, I would like to open it up to the four of you to share any uh, reflections on each other's presentations or if any questions have arisen um, as you've also been an uh, audience to the other three. Um, would anyone like to begin or does anyone have anything off the top of their head at the moment? If not, I can uh, start with a question or something that interests me. Uh, okay. Uh, if you have anything, just raise your hand or feel free to chime in. Uh, so I guess my uh, kind of uh, thought throughout this, um, also looking back to uh, the ALF virtual marathon project um, as a whole and uh, the themes that they kind of seek to address uh, when uh, creating these kind of projects focusing on intercultural dialogue. Uh, two of them specifically, um, I feel are relevant to the conversation. Uh, they have on one side uh, seeking to address the theme of extremism uh, and xenophobia and conflict and on the other side, the culture of peace. And at least to me, uh, the kinds of themes that have been discussed tonight, I somehow feel uh, can, can kind of be used to, I don't know, to influence people to in either direction. Um, and that, I mean, I guess it's up to the audience to choose how they understand uh, the artworks or um, the ideas being shared uh, with when looking back at different uh, expressions or of collective memory. Um, so I guess also from the audience perspective and then also the artist uh, slash academic perspective, uh, how, how do you think of these, these themes when trying to maybe look more to towards the uh, the side of culture of peace is that is there intention in the creation and reflection uh, or is that something that is kind of inherent in your practice and then it's up to the uh, audience to decide i hope that was a clear enough question to reflect on a bit uh, does anyone, would anyone like to 
comment on that? I can also share one more. Ah, Joanna. I will try to comment uh, uh, on what you said because I think uh, what what emerges from the discussion and from the presentations uh, it's uh, a common ground where arts become um, a space uh, where arts become arts the museum the uh, the culture becomes a space where we can search for uh, this small hidden uh, narratives that uh, were, were excluded from the big history. And I have the impression that the, the artworks that uh, have been presented in this uh, uh, discussion uh, try to, to put in place this uh, uh, the small, the, the, the non-important, the, the non-important narratives that were not written in the in the big history, and I think in this space, in this um, uh, area where art could reflect in a very personal way about things and to uh, give importance in things that they are really. Um, uh, not historical in the sense of uh, uh, writing history uh, could give us the space that we need to reflect on cultures uh, of peace. And I was very interested, for example, about the memories of trees, uh, how how how, is, how the how nature remembers the time of nature and how uh, how could, uh, as we saw it in Larissa's uh, work and the, uh, the reflection of Yale uh, after that. And I think also the idea of uh, art as a gesture where we can, um, uh, where can we can establish spaces of free exchange also this uh, create, are, are part of this of what you describe as culture of peace, in my opinion. Would anyone else like to respond, continue the discussion, or have another join with another question? If not, I have another thought and then maybe I can yeah okay I'll continue with one more thought and hopefully uh, we have some more uh, questions after that uh, I guess one kind of thought that came to me during this conversation was the combination of, of um, kind of three uh, ideas so collective memory uh, division and I guess I'm thinking it could be physical uh like the context of cyprus uh but also well this is also phys physical but uh also with diaspora and the collective memories that they develop and then also the incorporation of time and how it seems to me that also uh, a lot of collective memory with any kind of separation from um from the context or from the ongoing is uh, that division kind of stops the collective memory at a certain point in time. And then, for example, uh, Joanna, as you kind of, well, some of your thoughts made me think of this also that there's also the need then for new narratives or the artistic spaces that are bringing about ideas that weren't shared in the larger history, um, like the larger narratives, the larger historical narratives uh, with the people that this is also then this is this is coming at a point in time that goes beyond this mental division uh, beyond the collective memory and that actually is introducing new ideas new concepts that uh, may be very difficult for, um, for people to kind of connect with the collective memory that they've embraced very deeply. Um, I also, I don't know if anyone has any thoughts about the combination of those three. Um,
Okay, we won't be silent. <laughs> we can say something. Yes. <laughs> All right, like the, um, I, I have a problem with this collective memory thing. That's the pro that, that as I was writing um, this or this presentation, I was becoming more and more kind of um, having difficulties with that actually, and that's why I was talking about maybe um, as um, Joanna said as well that you know that. Um, this division and you have separate collective memories and this is a state ideology and you're going into like big narratives and you and you don't find yourself in them anyway so you start you know creating like what we did with the what what what one of the projects I talked about for example of collecting uh, all the uh, uh, archives of the plastic arts in North, North Cyprus was actually one of the ways of creating a memory in some way so it's a narrative actually, uh, so that it will become uh, part of the memory of whatever. And um, so it's it's not really, um, um, it, it, it, it's, it's difficult to talk about it. And it's difficult to say that there are common collective memories. It's uh, because um, the, the, if you, if, as I said, like if you see these as circles and, and you know, you try to, pack everything in there it's not there and everybody has their own circle you have many many centers and you have many many uh, memories you have many many collective uh, me memories and different uh, things and not one of them is necessarily um, uh, the one that you want so actually and and uh, you understood that that's why there's no reconciliation but that's not true I don't believe that that's why I think that you know you have to you have to um, it may, may not be your memory, but it, it is your. Um, uh, it is through dialogue that you try to understand it. Doesn't become your memory, but you understand. You and reconciliation doesn't have to happen because you have commonality in in your memories. It has to be the understanding and analysis of that that that should give you the reconciliation. Um, and also, it's really like um, it can. It, and also, for example, with this peace art. Let's say when we talk about peace art. I don't really understand that either. That that is also another thing that I don't understand because we are really creating pockets of things which are really not um, there, and and and I don't know what that means. Is it supposed to illustrate peace? Is it supposed to? So I have a problem with things like that too. For example, um, what does it mean uh, to, uh, uh, to do that? So um, it it doesn't necessarily. Mean I'm against it. I just don't understand it uh, because. Uh, one does it's uh, you you you're you're an artist and you're working on uh, uh, on things that you are interested in and you something like um, Larissa said you know she heard this story she read this story it took her all the way from wherever she was to take her roots to come all the way to some place and find this thing and then whatever that evoked in her she, she didn't have to illustrate it she was actually opening it up into so many different uh, ideas. Um, to talk about it, so that's not peace art. I mean, it's it's so it's so it's not it's not like I don't understand that concept in that sense. Um, uh, so maybe we, we want to. So I like to argue. So let's let's open up arguments like that. <laughs> uh, I just want to say I think. Uh, well, who who was next? Uh, yeah, I think you unmuted. Did you have? Did you want to share something? And if not, then I think we. Larissa is next, actually. Okay. Great. Uh, Larissa. Great. Well, I was going to refer Yael, so it will be a combination of both. Um, well, yeah, I was like a bit confused at first because um, I come from a denial culture where there is no collective memory because it's not being spoken. So it's very hard to talk about collective memory where there is so many suppression of censorship and also a denial of existence, which I was even when I was like doing this work and I was reading back and forth the yeah, Navarro's book and trying to grasp what's actually within my own personal story through what led me to uh, Cyprus too. And um, I mean, we're talking about a, a memory that's filled with ghosts actually and we're trying to um, translate these ghosts that we're haunted by all the time I mean especially in the uh, case of Turkey 
So um, I don't think it's not peace. The only peace that you can do with this memory or history, let's say, is the peace that you could ever have, which is to kind of reflect to it or like think your positionality within it. Because I think pos positionality uh, is very important to talk about these big traumatic events and uh, who's talking about it, where it's been talked, where it's been, I mean, if it's an artwork, where it's been showed or which institution has the ownership of that work are so many layers to uh, the work itself. It's, it has, just like history, it has so many layers to talk about it. So um, doing it and showing it to a viewer, referring to your first question, it has many, many layers of actually reconciliation of the country, of the institution, of you, of the artist, of the curator, of all of the texts that you gather up within it. Because I know that a lot of cases, because I do a lot of work surrounding history and uh, denial of it, that have been censored by institutions that because they, yeah, they cannot grasp the um, idea to talk about it. So, um, it, these are all of the things that we can do our gestures to open up the space because it's been it's already been very dictating and informative uh, in every other uh, yeah, in every perspective that has been explained such as history it's always somebody's writing it uh, so that's why Yona is saying these small uh, narratives are very important to dig deep into but also maybe um yeah, the, uh, nowadays I feel much more that most of the artists or cultural workers act as um, archaeologists, anthropologists, or writers, or all of these other titles. They grasp a lot of ideas from these other disciplines to dig deep into what they're actually drawn into. So all of these interdisciplinary uh, perspectives is actually opening up what actually Amber was saying opening the space up to more interpretations, actually. I can come in now, maybe, uh, after Amber and Larissa. I think that by now, almost we can declare that the concept of collective memory is over. It's traditional. We can just get rid of it. Let's use other concepts, because they're just too formalized, the concept. It's very conventional. Nobody believes in it. Even the people, the students who read those history textbooks created by Ministry of Ministers of Education don't believe in what they're reading. You know, if one were to go and do research and ask, you know, formalized questions, normative questions about what is the history of Turkey, of North Cyprus, of South Cyprus, even the students who would parrot parrot out their teachers' lessons would not believe in what they're saying. And people are very cynically positioned vis-a-vis -vis these collective memories that have been regurgitated to them by the older generations or by it's a certain kind of official history. So it would be the wrong way to approach any kind of project that is based on memory, I think anywhere somehow. And uh, in, in many ways, artistic work, and I, I think also, I hope anthropological work, archeological work, uh, it has moved beyond beyond that and uh, towards a more uh, approach that um, somehow looks for non-formal, informal uh, forms of fragmentary knowledge in the Benjaminian sense, uh, traces, objets trouvés, found objects, um, uh, forms of surprise element, etc., things that don't fit. And that also includes people's affects and emotions that don't necessarily, that aren't encapsulated in uh, grand narratives of, uh, of nations. So to give another example from my research, going back again to Musada, uh, when I um, spoke with people who now live in um, homes that uh, belonged to Armenians who were forcefully displaced from uh, Musada, uh, um, of course, uh, there is a, uh, as Larissa has been saying, Turkey is um, a, in a state of denial vis-a-vis -vis the Armenian genocide. But when you do research in these sorts of sites, you find people um, reflecting in very unlikely ways. So there was a Turkish lady there who uh, lived in the house of uh, an Armenian family. And as she spoke, she, she said, 
Armenians used to live here, like almost, uh, you know, trying to be silent in order to uh, not draw too much attention to something that is supposed to not be spoken about, Armenians inferring almost an enemy community in Turkey's um, uh, official environment, and yet also expressing a certain kind of empathy that she had created in herself vis-a-vis -vis the house that she lived in and the people who um, had lived there before uh, she was settled there and saying, um, I of, uh, often there are Armenians who come here and they, vi they visit this place and they cry about their homes. Wouldn't you cry if, if you had lost your home? And um, she um, uh, tears up as she talks about it. And uh, she says, uh, here, I imagine they must have had a clock and I put something else in its place. Here, I imagine that she must, they must have had uh, their bedroom, et cetera. These kinds of relations um, with people who aren't living there is something that I had also studied in, in Cyprus, in North Cyprus in particular. It's, it also exists in South Cyprus. People relating through their imaginations um, with um, what the lives of the people who inhabited these spaces might have been prior to this um, uh, exchange of population, ethnic cleansing, et cetera. So one finds far more surprising types of reflections when one actually engages with people and spaces and materialities than what collective memory allows for. Uh, and um, forms of empathy and forms of uh, unlikely feeling. And it, I think it's precisely those kinds of affects we might call them that artists also tap into. And this is where artistic work has so much power to move beyond um, any form of collective memory. And I would say I agree with Amber uh, in some sense, and this is not in any way to question um, your project as visual voices, but when one calls something peace art, it's almost instrumentalizes art and creates another formality, another normativity, and where art is supposed to actually break normativities and create serendipitous encounters. I don't know if that's what Amber was meaning, but I think, um, yeah, I mean, one probably wouldn't sit down to create a work of art as piece art. I mean, it might have those kinds of implications. Um, um, and, and however, when it's coined in that way, um, it might uh, be in danger of being instrumentalized somehow. So I share that bit of doubt that Amber also expressed. I can share some thoughts uh, emerging from the discussion. I, I share the skepticism towards collective memory. In the same time, I am actually very fascinated by the way in which memory comes to actual time. And it has the, the capacity of um, uh, having different layers and uh, uh, emerging in present. So in a way, I find in the, as much as we want to overpass uh, the ideas of, uh, uh, of, of big narrations, of collective memories, of, in the same time, we are all, all very often in the Cyprus context forced to deal with them uh, since they emerge uh, in the public space as very vivid, as very... Um, actual so what fascinates me it's the the relationship that memory has with time that it has the capacity of imprisoning us in the present although it's something that happened to our ancestors years ago uh, and in a process of trying trying to be detached from uh, the violences of the past of being critical of what happened before we we are also digging in history. We also become, um, uh, we also refer to history, to the past, to, to, to the memories of the groups that we belong or to the, to the communities that we, we were raised in. And in a way, it, it's difficult to escape from memory in the same time that we would like to overpass um, uh, its capacity of uh, uh, creating separations in between us. So, uh, and I think the only way to do that, it's also in, it's also digging in the past. Like we, we also try to find 
solutions in the past because we project, we often project the past to the future. And this relationship with time of, the, of memory, I find it very fascinating. I don't know if, if it makes sense the way I formulate it, but I, I find myself in this dilemma as an artist and as a person trying to define itself. All this, uh, uh, all this effort to identify and to also overpass uh, uh, traditional identifications. Uh, that's why I named my piece Identity Exhaustion because it creates all, also an exhaustion of trying to define uh, yourself, your community, your space, and I don't. I I hope I make sense. Can I say something? Uh, on, on, on, I think that some, a lot of the times we imagine these communities. In other words, like we should be renewing our own, our own uh, memory is memory. memory um, there's nothing that you can do about uh, groups of uh, people thinking that. But as artists, um, it is our duty in a way, or not duty, but it's a natural thing that comes out that to question that um, narrative. And that's where, the, that's where you start feeling that, you know, that this, um, um, uh, when we, as soon as we say my community, I realize I don't belong to any community. Actually, every single time, that's why the that's why there is a problem with with that kind of um, collective memory because there is no such community. It's all imagined, and we and and it's the it's the um, it's these kinds of concretized um, memories or, or or narrations that we have been fed that is really problematic um and and that's that i know i understand your fascination but the fascination has to be that how can i um uh, break this apart how can i you know um uh, basically atomize this and then rebuild and you don't have to rebuild everybody is rebuilding so then you realize what what other sorts of um communities are there and then then you're ready to move on uh, otherwise as you say it is very imprisoning uh, especially in, uh, in every country of course but cyprus as well um, as one of the biggest you know we, because we have had such a um, uh, oppressive um, society so far <laughs> that it yes it is problematic but um, I, I understand your fascination uh, in terms of it's there, but it's it's difficult because then you're it's difficult uh, if you don't break it apart, then you're complementing it all the time, and it's becoming more and more concrete, and that's really um, um, dangerous in some ways. It is. In the same time, it seems that from the past also emerged the alternative narratives that we try to establish as the project that you projected and also in Larissa's project, but also in the project I decided to, uh, to conclude my presentation of Ariela Zulai, where Palestinians and Jewish uh, uh, narrate histories from the past where the, um, uh, the established uh, uh, civil alliances even though we try to overpass uh, uh, history and the past, in the same time, we dig in the past to find the alternative, the, the, the different stories that could uh, reconciliate us or uh, create new identities, create new memories, create new stories. Uh, also, I find this fascinating that the past is very uh, powerful. I might jump in here. Um, well, I definitely agree with Amber about identities. I think identities have um, a poisonous effect on arts as an artist too. And if you're coming from, uh, again, a denial culture, sometimes the collective memories that are not being accepted or any memories are drawn into these, most of the minorities and they're stuck with that identity if they're not 
try to break it. So um, that's another grand narrative that it should be uh, destructed also. So it's a very tricky issue to handle uh, how it's been projected to you, how you want to turn it around as an artist, your subject and yourself as well, because it's always these, all of these identities Artist, being an artist is an identity too. Being uh, whatever your background is, is an identity too. So it's very carefully, should be carefully put and positioned. Mm, but um, yeah, I don't think that the answers of the new narratives are actually in the history. I think history is just a, um, a rubbish. Like it's something that has been written by somebody else to use it in something else which has totally an economic ties to the whole structure. Uh, so um, the reason that I, and also through like uh, uh, with the talk that we did with the ad before this uh, conversation, um, she shared with me with uh, some of her uh, articles, which I find very similar uh, positioning, like uh, perspective in both of our studies saying that, um, the most of the memories that are being told or uh, the juridical part of history has been is already out there and it's been denied for you know, even in the example that you give in the Palestinian Israel conflict issue, even in Turkey or even everywhere, it's already been there and it's not being sold. And so what can we do to discuss about these things outside than human uh, constructed ideologies, structures, so what I do is I try to look at other um, witnesses, I say, but yeah, is saying evidence, remnants, as she positions, to discuss these things through different positions, uh, different views, and add them to the storyline, because all of the things, all of the witnesses that has to explain these issues are either dead, they're not here, or they've been denied, or they've been never like, although the archives are lost or archives are there, but not being in considered. So we have to find different elements to look at and position them within the history to reach out these layers of existence of it. And I find in the example of yes, uh, Ashuk Mashuk in the, the spirituality stays there, although the community changes, but that says something about the timeline within that history, that it was spiritual at that point, and now it's spiritual again for a different community, the ritual of it still exists. I think these rituals and these, um, I guess, the auras, let's say, of these places, objects, subjects, um, are the ones that we can right now talk about of, of all of these traumas that has been passed and is with us, uh, yeah, and still lingers us in the present time. Um, so that's why we're, I'm, especially in my artwork, start to look very particular uh, non-human things to gather up within the story so that uh, position the uh, uh, camera, let's say, from a different perspective and still explain the same story. So well, it's mostly about rendering visible in the, in the public sphere this alternative and the hidden stories that already exist. Uh, and uh, where, uh, where the institutional history never considered as important or uh, gave any reference. Yeah, I think that we might be talking about inventing new methodologies, both new artistic methodologies as well as new academic methodologies in conversation with one another. And if one thinks of uh, spaces that have been um, rendered or turned into debris through war uh, or genocide or ethnic cleansing, um, and then if you have academics or civil society activists also, or, or politicians trying to assemble that into um, normative stories that are then going to be somehow spoken to each other through formalized procedures of uh, peace processes or conflict resolution, a lot of things get lost. So instead of doing that, um, I, I mean, I'm wondering if one can actually follow other kinds of um, uh, traces and um, somehow appro approach both artistic work and research as uh, 
a form of collecting collecting debris, collecting remnants um, that don't uh, in any way, in the Benjaminian sense, uh, turn into a puzzle that is complete. Like one can never find all the pieces of a puzzle in order to create the full picture or the full narrative in a way. Um, and yet each piece of the puzzle uh, brings one another kind of reflection that has been um, somehow uh, silenced. So the spiritual aspect of this that I uh, refer to uh, references uh, the Armenians who were exterminated and uh, forcefully displaced uh, from, from this space. Uh, it also refers to uh, what is silenced, um, what is omitted perhaps, what is effaced through secular modernism. So certain forms of resonances, um, Larissa called it aura, uh, that remain forms of memory that can be called cosmological memory, um, that, that somehow have resisted being um, washed over through um, forms of uh, state denial, one, as well as secular modernity. Um, yeah, so in a sense, like, uh, I guess inventing new ways of looking is what artists do and inventing new methodologies is what academics do and in that platform we can have some interesting conversations would anyone like to continue on uh, this conversation or even pose a another question to the group I just, think just in addition to Yaz's last note, this cosmological memory is transferred from different groups. I mean, between different groups also, right? I mean, it's not like, I mean, even if it is some, I mean, it was an, I mean, a group of enemies, but you inherit that cosmological memory from the ones that you, I mean, expelled or try to get rid of, right? That's right, that's right. And um, some of this has often been romanticized as shared sacred spaces, and there is a whole literature on that. Yes, there is a shared aspect of this, but um, I'm also trying to figure out what has happened to spaces which, where there isn't this romanticized sort of sharing. Maybe there used to be, but uh, major violence has taken place, like a genocide. And somehow what has also been um, attacked um, are the people who were part of that space, who were exterminated. But was, what has also been attacked is um, everything associated with them, their land, their houses, uh, their trees, nature, as well as their cosmological worlds. Uh, and once a huge reshuffling has taken place, new people are settled in their place. Uh, one can read Palestine in that way too. What has happened to this, those spaces where, which were associated with saints? So um, some Antakya and Samanda are full of visitation sites, holy visitation sites, sites which are called ziyaret, in Turkish ziyara in Arabic. And this is all about um, somehow um, rendering sacred spaces which indeed have certain kinds of spiritual aura or spaces which are associated with um, particular miracles. So for example, Hazir uh, Ziyarets, uh, there are many of them. They are not only Hazir Ziyarets, but there are many Hazir Ziyarets in Antakya and its environs, actually all the way to Adana and Mersin in spaces especially inhabited by Arab Alawis. And when people recount when this Ziyaret was built, often there isn't a direct memory, but there is some kind of spiritual story. It's, it's, it's a reference to somebody's dream, for example, uh, where uh, Hazir appears and somehow uh, aids some, somebody or assists somebody, the dreamer, in resolving a problem in their lives. So it's, it references dreams, but it also references the sighting of Nur, Nur in Turkish, as well as in Arabic, divine light descending from the sky and touching a particular space in a village, sometimes in the town, in the Harbiya neighborhood of, of uh, Antakya, there are sites which um, are referenced as associated with Nur having been cited. And there they build um, a Hazir Ziyarete. Uh, 
So that's a very different kind of memory. And I have had people walk me through these ziarets in, some, in Antakya and Samanda and its environs, almost uh, writing a co cosmography of this space. You know, it's, it's a non-secular sort of geography of, of this space and uh, spiritually referenced um, memories. So when you talk to people, you know, I could have also gone to, to Antakya and spoken to uh, Arab Alawi people and said, so what is exactly, you know, just to, more normative questions about their identity and how they find themselves in conflictual positions with Sunni, Sunni Turkish Antakya residents, as well as others. And people would have told me a lot of more normative sounding collective histories. And yet when one spends more time with people uh, and amongst them, there are many other kinds of histories and memories that emerge that are never rendered uh, or um, somehow narrated when the researcher goes directly for stories of identity or community or collectivity. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know whether there is questions from the audience. Aldan, do you have in the Facebook? I think uh, there are plenty of viewers, but no comments or questions. So we have a shy audience tonight. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think uh, since there are no questions or comments from the audience, uh, I don't know if anyone wants to continue on this uh, conversation that's recently started. If not, um, I think we can close the conversation there. So I just like to ah. I found very interesting uh, what Anwar said about uh, the difference, the importance of the difference, which is more fascinating and more interesting. Uh, and in this process of trying to create the new communities, new methodologies of inventing ways of discussing about the past, which overpass traditional terms, uh, I think that the, dif the difference in between us could be fundamental in creating uh, new spaces where we share and we discuss about this difference. And I think what is very important in the artistic practice is that it evaluates this difference. Okay, I think, uh, oh, go ahead. Uh, oh, sorry. I uh, just one little um, uh, comment on you, Joanna. I, I actually found uh, a space in, um, uh, in the last project that I'm doing, and that is the architecture, architecture of Cyprus, because we have been so much, uh, we, as an island, we've been colonized by so many different cultures throughout history, and we have had so many different uh, um, remains of these uh, different cultures, mainly in architecture, because that's the witness in some way, and that's the evidence. Uh, and, um, and so actually, because I'm writing on architecture right now, on, not an architecture, but I'm writing on an architect right now. Um, what is very interesting, uh, Joanna, is that the difference is not necessarily, is it, the, it's not just the difference, it's also the, um, okay, where I'm coming from is like, when I'm doing this work and I'm, uh, I am, I've been pu publishing it on the Facebook page of Cypriot Modernists, uh, this work that, that, of this particular ar um, architect. And uh, what I'm seeing there is, is quite, uh, I, I, it's very engaging, everybody's very engaged in there and they're always talking, about, everybody's looking at it and they're trying to find out modernist architecture is the start of the Republic of Cyprus, if you're going to go political with that, you know. So we have had like British, the, the Ottomans, the British, the Lusinians, the this, the that, all of this. And then uh, when we look at whether there is like a true Cypriot architecture, let's say, okay, from looking from, from formal point of view, um, what is it? What is it? Because everything that we look at is like from another, it's been imported from another society, from another culture. And the modernists are, um, the modernist architecture in Cyprus uh, is also imported, of course, to an extent, but it's, it's there's also vernacular architecture, where right? you see that they are not uh, blind to the 
geography, the culture and all that of the people that, that exist here. So they actually built, built modern architecture in, in consideration of that. So in that sense, there is something common. It's a, I'm saying that the, by um, standing, by, by, by valuing um, uh, um, cultural references of all parties um, equally, um, you're bound to have some kind of commonality at, at points. But those are at points, you see, this, this, this, it, everything is so dynamic, everything is so changing. We cannot, we cannot call that one, oh, now we have this, we don't. Every time we think that we have this, it dissolves in our hands and something else happens again. So in that sense, it's not, it's not, I'm not negative about it, I'm very positive about it, as a matter of fact, because it's, um, it's, it's in our hands to make it. It's in our hands to um, find new ways of looking at things. It's always a way of looking at things and getting enough consensus to, um, to make that live for a while and then realize it's going to go away again and then redo it. I'm getting darker and darker here, so I can see. <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> so that, that's it. It's just a uh, little note. But I find very interesting this uh, dynamic process. It's a process of becoming, which also it's a very valuable a way of thinking identities and of thinking of uh, uh, uh, the way that the, the the, the art comes to place as a process of uh, uh, of learning, of becoming, of, uh, uh, of of a realization, and also this is probably the way that we should dig in the past so we can imagine the future as a becoming process. Uh, I just want to share. Thank you. Uh, for the continued conversation. I just want to, we do have only three minutes left, but we have one uh, comment coming from the audience. So I want to make sure we have time to share. I'll go ahead and read it. Uh, what seems to be emerging is that has, is what seems to be emerging, emerging is all that has been left out of the official history and the constructive, con constructed collective memory that a given nation is supposed to have or digest and operate from. This could leave a lot of people slash communities cold as it does not, uh, does not their individual or common experiences throughout a given historical period. In the face of this reality, art has the space to find, work on and reflect on these realities. It is important to create an alternative history and, and form an alternative archive, which can ease our relationships in the present with empathy and move us to a possible future in a better understanding. Uh, let's see, we have two minutes left. Uh, if anyone would like to respond uh, to that comment, uh, I'll have a short pause. And if not, uh, ah, we have a continuation and then I'll do another short pause. Uh, as artists and researchers, if we learn to be aware of this and look for all the experiences, be it of people or of places, and build our work around that to include that in our work so it emerges as a tool for inquiry. And I will have another brief pause in case anyone wants to take the last two minutes. And if not, I will, I would like to I think it's time to close the conversation uh, as we're approaching eight o'clock. And as we can see from Amber's screen, it's already getting dark and it is time to uh, go our separate ways. Uh, I want to thank all of you uh, for the conversation and your contributions. It has really uh, been a pleasure uh, having all of you with us tonight. Uh, I also want to share a quick reminder uh, to our audience uh, that we will have another event in the Overlapping Circles series uh, again on Thursday, June 24th uh, from 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, we hope to see you all there and wish you a lovely rest of the night. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Bye. Uh,
Oh, we also uh, just to let you, we have uh, stopped live streaming. Um, <laughs> okay. So it's, now it's just the six of us. Uh, well, seven if you well eight if you include. Uh, I think Isu is still with us and <laughs> no. Oh. I was speaking about this. Yes, yeah, okay. uh, but yes, I just wanted to say another thank you and. Uh, Yes, my apologies for the awkward uh, beginning. Uh, as you can tell, my um, multitasking skills are yet to be developed. So, uh, but yes, thank you. I hope you enjoyed and uh, we'll be in touch soon with all of the follow up. Thank you. Thank you. So much. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Shall I stay or go? Bye. Stay, stay. <laughs> okay, I'll stay. <laughs> I think it went pretty well, no? Yeah, yeah I, was, I, I also have some statistics from now for um, Facebook. Uh, it looks like uh, it reached about 445 people, but in terms of engagements, we had from 197. So, and I hope people will keep watching while, you know. Yeah, but uh, what does it mean, like 400 people? I, it's basically from sharing, you know, people connect I, and do it, come and go or whatever. I, I mean, uh, so I, the, I, actual, I the actual engagements was, it said 197. So we'll keep watching people, it as it grows. So the people who watched it, uh, was around hundreds or how many viewers you had? People who engage, I mean, it, it, I think it's not always the same people. So I don't know if it's the same like 20, 30 people or people who come and go because we also shared it and people, I guess, uh, clicked on it or liked it or shared it. So out of these kind of different kinds of engagements, it said 170 and 197. Hmm. Yeah. See. But yeah, but I I, think, I'll yeah. keep looking at it to see if there is anything more accurate in terms of more insights and stuff. I'll let you know. Yeah, great. Thank you. I mean, and I hope we'll have more clicks afterwards, like people watching it. Um, I, I think we're still recording, by the way. Oh, ah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I should stop that. Uh, uh, 